guten Abend. Herzlich willkommen im Literaturhaus. Very welcome, Masa Mengiste. It's a huge pleasure to have you. you here. Thank you. My name is Gesa Schneider and I'm the director of the Literaturhaus. It's the first event uh, we do this size since beginning of March. Um, it feels kind of crowded, even if you're only 60, and usually we fill the space with 120. <laughs> so this is, uh, yeah, that's also new. In Media Res, I would like to ask Maza, there was this article in the newspaper <laughs> <laughs> mentioning something about coffee. So what is this with coffee in Switzerland or coffee in you? Um, I didn't know the Swiss were so proud of their coffee. Um, you know, it started in Ethiopia, right? Not in Switzerland. Um, but I made a comment and it was a small comment in a conversation that lasted more than an hour about racism and very serious things, but we talked about coffee briefly. <laughs> and I just mentioned that I had not had really good coffee here. I, part of it is because of the lockdown before anyone gets upset. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I have been getting emails from um, complete strangers uh, telling me where, where I can find good coffee. And uh, I'm learning a lot <laughs> about The Swiss love for coffee. I had no idea. I think I, I really hit an, a, a nerve, a national nerve. <laughs> so um, what did people offer, propose, offer you to buy you good coffee or to... to well, they, um, the, latest, uh, the latest email that I received today, uh, just before I was on my way here, invited me to an Ethiopian-style coffee ceremony. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's here too. Um, And I've, I've, someone is sending me um, a bag of coffee before I leave. Uh, someone has given me directions to a few others. And someone just sent me a photograph of a bag of coffee uh, from Ethiopia that's available in the Neumarkt area. And I think it's called Sidama, which is a, a region of Ethiopia, but it's called Corona. <laughs> <laughs> So I might, I'll try that. Maybe I'll try it. So yeah, it's been a, a, a few days of only talking about coffee. <laughs> so um, I would just like to say a few words about the project Writers in Residence and a few words about Maza. You've been here during very strange at the same time, very quiet and very violent times. And I think we have the opportunity to talk about that later as we will open The discussion to the public. Um, when we will open the discussion to the public, the PWG Foundation, the Writers in Residence Association, and Literaturhaus Zürich offer guest writers the opportunity to write during six months. And it's a project generously supported by the Canton and the City of Zurich. And the PWG Foundation, it stands for Preisgünstigen Wohn- und Gewerberaum der Stadt Zürich and is acquiring prop. Buildings um, and for in that way permanently taking them out of um, the market and um, avoiding speculation mm -hmm. and cre creating in that way affordable um, housing. And I would like to thank Pablo Asandri from Literaturhaus and Cornel Ringli from Stiftung PWG for organizing all the projects. So Masa Mengiste is the 19th writer in residence mm -hmm. already. <laughs> um, she's a novelist and essayist and her novels Beneath the Lion's Gaze, Unter den Augen des Löwen and her new novel The Shadow King here um, has been published this published has been published last year and is still is not translated into German so let's touch wood that it will happen soon it has won gained the highest praise by writers such as Salman Rushdie and Marlon James and I very much I look very much forward to this talk we wanted to talk to narrow it a bit and talk about the role of photography and photographies in this novel And it's an ambivalent instrument and a tool in the way that it records violent, but it is never neutral. It is also a way of exercising, mm. exercising violence. Mm -hmm. 
So um, how um, was there a photo as a starting point of the novel or what was... <clears throat> um. Oh, oh just quickly. Oh, and yes. uh, Maza will talk a bit about the photos. You will see them mm -hmm. there. And then we talk a bit ab yeah. about this and the novel. And then I will open, we will open the discussion. Yeah. Um, I, it's an interesting question you ask about whether there was a photograph that was a starting point. Um, I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I recognized a photograph at, early on and said, this is what I will I want to write about, but um, I had heard the stories since I, growing up in Ethiopia, I had heard the stories of the Italian invasion um, by Mussolini. I had heard stories of family members of mine, my on my mother's side, um, on my father's side, who had fought against the Italians. I had images as a child of these stories Uh, when when I was told that the the people who answered the call to to mobilize in the Ethiopian army were often peasants, farmers, they had only the weapons that they would use to guard their livestock, and those weapons tended to be um, 40 or 50 years old from the first conflict with Italy in the late 1890s, when Italy tried to invade the first time, Ethiopians had those guns, they were using it to protect um, their livestock fr from, uh, from, you know, hyenas. Um, those were the weapons they had besides spears. And they answered the call and they were about to confront the most... Um, highly weaponized modern army in Europe at that time, Italy. Um, Italy had perfected air warfare in Libya through the 20s in what they called a pacification campaign, um, but was one of the most brutal colonizing efforts at that time. Everything they did in, in Libya, they were carrying over into Ethiopia. So here were these Ethiopians who were poorly equipped and somehow five years later they won. They beat Italy and Italy was sent back. If you can imagine as a child growing up with these stories, um, the, the pride that it filled me with and the pride that, it in, that every Ethiopian that I knew talking about this, even now, I joke, but it is really not a joke. You can have a, a wedding And it can be the most beautiful wedding. You can have a baby shower. And there will be one Ethiopian that will say, and we won that war. And then everybody will say, we won. You know, and then, and then we start talking about war. Um, even the happy occasion. So this, this is how I, this is what I grew up with. Coming to the United States where, uh, you know, we will talk about some of this later, but facing intense racism. Um, for the first time realizing, oh wait, I'm not surrounded by people who look like me. And in fact, they think that I am less and I am less human because of how I look. If I didn't have these stories, I think my spirit would have been crushed. But the way it was, I felt sorry for them because they didn't have the history I did. My history has always been older. Um, so I imagined as a child, These stories, this military, they just have rifles. This is actually very modern for Ethiopia at that time. These would be the um, emperor's first guards. So they tended to have the uniforms and they tended to have relatively new rifles and they were going off to war. This is how I imagined this. And also the way that my family would have fought, not in this um, more modern military, but they were the farmers and they were the peasants that left everything on the farm and went to a camp that was in the middle of a village and said, here I am and here's my gun or here's my spear. They had no weapons. They were dressed all in white, which is the traditional Ethiopian wear, which also made them perfect targets for the Italians, but they didn't care. 
and this is the majority of the military. And those were that that side was my family. Um, so I imagined the war with these kinds of images, these men in white running against tanks, against um, cannons and artillery, all in white, very easy to see on hills, and somehow they won. Um, and sometimes I would ask my family, well, what were the Italians like? You know, what are Italians like? And before I lived in Rome, I didn't really know much. Um, and you get, if you can see this, this tends to be the stereotype of Italians with wine. This is in the middle of war. They have a guitar. They're singing. There's food. How can they possibly do the things that they did in Ethiopia? They're, they're way too irresponsible, way too good-natured to conduct the brutality of the war. Um, but this is one of the photographs that Italians took of themselves. This is the way they wanted to be remembered, not necessarily the way that they actually behaved in war. And looking at this image and um, having a sense of where it might have been, because I can recognize some of the clothing, if you can see that man with, with the turban uh, facing just the back, it's, it's an Ethiopian man. And I think I might know the region, I might know where it is. And if I do, then I think I might know who some of these people might be. Um, and if I know that, then I know what battles took place in this area, which means that while they are celebrating, I know what's happening outside that window, which is a very different image than what's happening here at the table. And so this is one of the ways that I began to use photographs to construct by looking at this man and saying, do I know where people came from in Ethiopia that dressed like this? And that will help me start narrowing down what's happening. Um, someone took this, it's a casual gathering, it's a casual photograph, and it is, you can think of it as an innocent photo until you think about the stereotypes of, of Italians that this helps to compound and emphasize, but you don't think about what's happening out of the frame, out that window. And that was where I wanted my story, the book to begin, what's happening outside that window. Um, but of course, war is not always the, the violence of it. War is also the friendships that, that develop around the table. War is also the relationship that this man has that has his back turned. Um, and I've always wondered, and I, I hope you can see, um, I've looked at him for many years trying to think about, everybody knew that they were getting their photograph taken, right? Because you can see that some people have their glass up. They, this man has turned around. Um, the person with the guitar at the wall has stopped and he's looking at the camera. And the only one that seems to be refusing to turn around is the Ethiopian man. And so I have often thought, and also the man, there's a man right beside him that's cut off and he's not turning around either. And I think in those acts of that not turning around, which I think could be a refusal, I'm not going to do this. That's also war. That's also an act of defiance and maybe for me an act of bravery. That if they could not help being there, they were going to, going to try to at least control what they did when they were there. Um, this is one of the photographs that uh, really started getting me thinking um, well into the writing of the book that these men brought their cameras with them and they were well aware of um, how to use it, how to stand so that they projected an image um, so that this was something they could take back home and say, look at me, this is what I looked like during the war. Uh, these, these images were constructed they're posing, they're well aware of the camera, they are well aware that this photograph is being made and it will be somebody's memory and it will be a way to remember this and maybe forget something else. 
Uh, this one was where I think really everything started for me. I was well into the writing of it, of my book, and I came across this. And uh, the book is called The Shadow King, partly because of this, uh, this photograph here, because it was this that made me understand the power of the photographer um, the way that the photographer is always present in every photograph that, that he makes. And um, everything is a constructed image. There is nothing here that is um, casual in any way. This is meant to project something about the Italian and this photographer. Um, the man is a prop. The, the, the East African man is a prop for what Italians want to think of themselves. Um, I, I've thought about this. This is, I, it's, a, it's a photograph of domination. It's a photograph of strength. Um, it's a photograph of look what we have and look what we can do. We can stand in front of an Ethiopian whose land we've taken, he can't do anything. There's more of us than there is of him. Um, he's barefoot. And I suspect he might be a prisoner. And, uh, you know, the, you can just see the differences in, in dress and in attire. Um, he looks like he might be a soldier just from, from his jacket. So this image for me let me understand that the photographer is always present in everything. And it helped develop the character of um, Ettore in, in my book. And I began to wonder not about the people that were in the, in the photographs as much, but I wondered, I started to wonder, well, who is this man that's forced to, forced or wants to take these photographs? What does it mean to him um, that he's doing this? And how does it change a human being to take photographs like this, to become either, um, to become a useful tool as much as a camera is in war. And that's how the, the Ettore came about. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, this, um, I remember I was living in Rome and I was writing my character. I was really thinking about how to tell the story from an Italian perspective um, without without making it stereotypical. Because I went to Italy, not, I didn't know much, meaning that um, my sense of what Italians were like was really based on just a few, um, a few friends, but they were Italian American. There were movies, but they're generally not very good because they're full of stereotype. You know, the pasta, the wine, and mamma mia. You know, and I said, but what, what kind of human being enacts violence on another human being? And what does it do to them? And how can I create that? Um, I started going into flea markets across Italy, made friends with many of the vendors. And there was one that in Rome that took most of my money. And uh, he called me one day and he said, I have something for you. So I went and um, he had a stack and I'll show you the next photograph is also from, from him. And he said, I think you might like some of these. And I saw this one and I said, um, I've just found my character because um, I think it's very easy to think of cruelty in only very flat terms of, of violence that's always up here in anger. And this photograph showed me somebody who, um, who's more complicated. There are more complicated ways to be cruel and brutal uh, than what we, what we see in really bad murder movies, you know. Um, and I was more interested in the complications of human beings who do things that might also break them inside, and yet they still do them. And 
in looking at this photograph and looking at this man's face, um, it seemed to me that I was looking in the face of somebody who was both angry and determined and also broken. And I used that as a way to start moving into my character and also as a way to, so to of uh, Carlo Fucelli. Yeah. Um, and it was also became a way for me to understand the, um, maybe the vulnerabilities in somebody like this. And that he was one of the harder characters I had to write because I didn't know before this photograph how to inhabit um, as a writer, inhabit the mind and the emotions of another human being who would look at me and want me dead. Um, and he, uh, this photo helped me complicate that. So, yeah, and I don't know if I like Carlo Fucelli in my book, but um, here he is. Uh, oh, God. This one is still a mystery to me, and I'm just putting it there so you can see that um, war creates very interesting and complicated relationships. And really what war does is um, it's not always violence. It's not always brutality. It's not always two sides charging at each other on a hill. There are also um, relationships that develop what, in whatever way that they are. And... Um, People are not always on, on that battlefield. They're not always in their tents. They're interacting with, with the populations that they, um, they are trying to conquer, that they are fighting, that they are killing. And I saw this, and I still don't understand it, um, but the little boy is uh, Ethiopian, and he's wearing a Balila uniform, and the Balila were the fascist youth. They were in Italy and they were also in Eritrea and Somalia and in Ethiopia eventually. And they were youth that were being trained, like the Hitler youth. They were being raised with uh, fascist ideology. So that uniform, which looks almost identical to this man, um, that's an Italian uniform that this little boy is wearing. What I found interesting about this is their poses are the same. The little boy is mimicking the, the older man. He wants to be like him. But what I found really telling about this um, is that this man has likely given this uniform to this little boy, but he's kept the little boy barefoot, which is a status. Like you will not ever be exactly like me. You'll know your place. Um, and I find this a really interesting image. What I also like here, and for me the thing that completes this, is the woman way in the back. And I've always wondered what she thought, because she's caught on the camera like mid-motion, and I think she's looking going, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know? So I've always wondered about her. She's that passenger going, you know, that passerby, walking by, going, these people are crazy, and I just want to go home. So that's just another aspect of daily life. Life goes on. People are still needing to do things. Um, but in the, in the midst of that, you have these complicated um, things that I can't, I don't quite understand happening. Um, this is a photograph that's in my book. There's only, there are only two photographs in the book, and this is at the very end. And um, I was working, trying to imagine uh, my central character, Hirut, who is a maid, um, just a girl who is working in the home of a couple. And when the war starts, um, she, she follows, she follows the, the head of the household because he has an army. His wife is gathering the supplies and getting the women together. And Hirut um, has to do what she's told. And, but somewhere along the way, I don't want to give too much away, um, but when the, um, her, the woman that employs her, not employs because she's not paid, but the woman who's her boss, uh, Aster, decides that she wants to fight in the war. 
Hiru joins and becomes a soldier as well. And so the central part of, of this book is um, a woman that, a young girl that I imagined, that I imagined her looking like this. And then I found the photograph and I said, this is Hirut. Um, so it's a character very much uh, like this young girl would look, even with the dress, the, the just, you can tell it's old, it's worn. Um, it tells her status very, very clearly. Eventually she becomes a soldier. And one of the, one of the soldiers that really inspires villagers to continue the fight against Italy. And eventually she becomes one of the top guards of the Shadow King. I won't say anything else, right? <laughs> um, and then uh, I started, as I, as I was researching this book um, and going through photographs, reading documents, going through fascist archives, I started finding bits of information, a headline in the New York Times or in The Guardian about a woman who was fighting next to her husband and her husband fell and was killed and she picked up his rifle and led 2000 of his men to victory. And when I saw that, and that was in a November 1935 article in the New York Times, I said, oh my God, I had no idea about this history. I did not know this at all. And in fact, the, the stories, anything, everything I knew is based on that first photograph I showed you of men who went off to war. Um, but here is the story of this woman. And for her to have picked up the gun when her husband fell and then have let, you know, for her to lead the charge and, and um, lead the rest of his men, that had to have meant she was standing right next to him before he fell which means that she had to have been fighting all along. And this was one of my first clues about the role of women in the military in Ethiopia. And after I found that out, I started searching some more with a very focused research. And this is one of the other photographs um, I found. And this really helped establish for me a sense of historical accuracy. I don't want to make things up. I did not want to make things up. Um, I wanted to write what actually happened. And this was one that helped me. And uh, this was, um, her name is Wezaro Ababac. I know that now. And I think this was taken in 1936. I know that um, I can tell that this is a posed photograph, even though it's her and she fought and it's been recorded, but there's no way that any soldier in Ethiopia would have worn shoes and never fancy shoes. But um, she's dressed for this photograph. She's proud, but every, everyone was barefoot. They fought barefoot. So she would not have worn shoes, but these are very, these are really nice. Um, and I like that touch that this is what she wanted to do for this picture with her pistol and her, <laughs> and her rifle. Um, but this, uh, this just gave me a confirmation that I was on the right track and it helped inspire, um, inspire me to write about Aster and, um, Hirut and know that they were, they really did exist. Well, thank you so much, you. Maza. Um, this uh, novel is, uh, it's, it's a wonderful read. It's a very challenging read. It will haunt you for a long time. I really encourage you to read it and photos play a huge role along all along the book. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted to ask about um, the photographer in the book, Et Ettore, mm -hmm. and his relationship. His, how you just do you um, describe him as very multi-layered? There's no yeah. not one one-dimensional character in the book, and he has this also relationship to Hirut. Mm -hmm. um, she is photographed. How is he coping with this? problem of being um, at the same time an observer, but in no way a neutral yeah. observer? Um, yeah, photographs are never neutral. 
I think that was the, the one thing I, I, I realized. I mean, I, we've known this. Um, if any of any photographs you've ever seen from the colonial era, they're not neutral photographs, no matter how genteel or beautifully they might be shot. They're not neutral. And I, um, and those photographs don't say anything about the African or the Asian person that's, uh, or Native American. Um, it doesn't say anything about them. It's all, a, they're a reflection of what the photographer wants you to know about that European force. And uh, I, you know, when I was writing the book and thinking about um, the different sides in this, thinking about photography, I was also very, in, I was in Rome and became really interested in um, the full Italian history of this, of this war as well. And I had gone to... Um, Trieste, mm -hmm. and I, um, I had gone to visit, uh, right outside of Trieste is a, a former rice factory that eventually became, uh, that was used as an internment camp for Italian Jews who were rounded up and then eventually sent east into, mostly into Auschwitz, and, then, and they died there. And I wanted to see that camp um, to see it. And uh, as I was walking through, I started coming across certain names and I started um, realizing, wait, you know, sometimes the names also indicated that they had been part of the military. And the years let me know that they had probably been in Ethiopia and Eritrea or in Libya. And when I left there, I, I went back home and I started looking through videotapes from the Shoah Foundation of testimonials from survivors and did a quick search, typed in Africa. And there were videos, um, testimonials, soldiers who had been based in Ethiopia who were then sent home, um, rounded up. Sometimes they survived and sometimes they didn't. And that was a story that Italians didn't really talk about. Those soldiers that had been sent, that were part of that army and were fighting as fascists, um, who suddenly found the military turned against them. Some committed suicide. Uh, some of the top, top military just killed themselves rather than be um, when they were called back and when the anti-Semitic laws were taken into effect, uh, they would they wanted they did not want it was humiliating for them. Uh, but I wondered what what does that do to a person to be fighting for something that you think is really is for you or that you are? And then slowly you start hearing news that, wait, my parents are being you know, have lost their jobs. Now they can't go to parks, but I'm in the military in Ethiopia or in Libya or in Eritrea. What am I doing? Um, and when Italy created racial segregation laws, it was all of the military, including some of the Jewish military that enacted these uh, laws. And then the following year, they were the victims of it. And I wanted to think about what that meant. Um, I talked to, I talked to some um, historians in Italy and said, I think there is a connection between the racial segregation laws that happened in Ethiopia in 1937 and the anti-Semitic laws that took effect in Italy in 1938. He said, there's no relation. And I said, I think you're wrong. <laughs> I think you, I respectfully disagree. I still disagree. Um, so there's a connection. Orish, yeah. Jewish. He's Jewish. He is there with a camera. He is taking photographs. He is um, taking photographs of prisoners of war or people just before they're killed. Um, he's doing this because he happens to have a camera. He's doing this because he understands his, his very vulnerable position. Mm -hmm. He's doing this to stay safe, but he's also just doing it because that's what you do. You're a soldier, isn't, you should follow orders. And I wanted to um, really 
examine that that really complicated um, that complicated situation he found himself in, and his very complicated relationship with Carlo Fucelli, who is a character that most people hate, uh, but Carlo has some redeeming qualities and it has to do with a Torre. I'm not gonna say more on that. So literature has a power to uh, at the same time describe what a picture can be, but also transcend it in a way, can, be, can become more, can mm -hmm. tell more, can tell what is behind it or can even complexify what we see but couldn't see um, at first. So I think there is a very intricate relationship in this book between pictures, invented pictures, describe, description of violence and um, the, the stating the fact mm. that how this violence can be um, at the same time used and overcome in a way. Mm -hmm. So how would you, um, for example... How did you deal with the, f because it's very, your book is very violent at the same time. I mean, it's, it's incredibly um, daring also in ch um, to have not only the violence between the, the uh, Ethiopians, the it Italians, but in the context of feminism, we will mm -hmm. talk about mm -hmm. that later, mm -hmm. women and men. But how would you, um, for you, what would be the relationship between uh, seeing a picture and writing it and then literature? Uh, yeah, I made a decision very, very early on in the writing of the book that I would not put photographs in the book. I would not put Ettore's photographs in there. Um, I wanted to work in that space Uh, how do I describe it? I wanted to work in the space of the invisible mm -hmm. so that I'm, if you look at a photograph, what you get is a frozen moment. But I wanted to work around that moment and look at what happened just before, just after, and everything else that's left out of the frame. And words are the only thing that, that could give me that opportunity to do that. So I, um, I wanted to think about how the photograph manipulates so that we look at one thing but forget everything else. And how can I force the viewer to look at not only what the photographer thinks we should look at, but the other things that he hopes we never see. Uh, and that's that's why I used what I, what I call word images mm -hmm. as opposed to the photograph. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to keep these images and the people photographed alive so that they're not just frozen still um, in a book. Another thing is the relationship between, for example, um, it's a bit of a side story, but for example, he would and us there. Mm. Um, cause I... I felt very strongly about um, the fact that there is a very strong power relationship going on between these two, but at the same time, they are both very strong. Mm -hmm. So um, there again, you always work against what people would expect of a, a, what can a relationship be, what can power struggles be, etc. What yeah. is this? As the, what is this relationship between these two women? You know, Aster is. The, is the, the woman of the house where Hirut is a maid. Um, Aster feels very threatened by Hirut because Hirut is, is younger. She notices that Kidana, her husband, feels an affection for Hirut that makes Aster very jealous. Um, she is antagonistic towards Hirut. She's also of a higher social status. Mm -hmm. She she thinks Hirut is nothing. She told, you know, at early on, relatively early on in the book, she said, you think the world was made for you, but you were made for the world. You have to remember your place. Your mother knew her place. You need to learn your place. Um, Aster, so the, she, she just lives in a world where it is about status and class and Hirut mm -hmm. will always be lower. 
she told Hirut, you're less than the dirt in my fingernail. Um, I think a, one kind of book would have had Hirut, oh my God, I don't want to give a lot away, but one kind of book would have had Hirut, you've seen those movies, you've seen the films where the, you know, in the very end, that person stands on a hill and the sun is shining and the wind is blowing and the music is coming up and they're victorious over everything. <laughs> you know, but that's easy. That's an easy story and that's not really the way life goes. Um, I wanted to create the kind of relationship that would have happened in Ethiopia in a system that has been um, so divided by class, by ethnicity, by, by religion, by so many different things that if you were born in one part of the society, it's very rare to move up. Mm -hmm. And what would Hirut and Aster do in the military? What would they, how would they begin to react or, or interact with each other when they both become prisoners? That's all I'm saying with that part. Um, I wanted to think about it in a realistic term. I don't term. think you give too much away. Okay, good. Really, because uh, I, I just think perhaps <laughs> we should say that it's a book about, um, well, there are these lot of characters, but one of the main characters is Hirut, and she becomes a soldier. Yeah. We can say this, yeah, this you can much. Say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually they're captured. Um, yes. And what happens in that prison, though, for me was a very important thing. Um, I wanted it to be as realistic as possible. I didn't want it to be a Hollywood movie. Where, But wait. Okay, we won't talk about that yet. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so their relationship is complicated. Okay. But both of them, even within the dynamic, the dynamics of power uh, between them, where Aster is always here and Hirut is here, so, and then they, you know, they help each other. Um, both of them have to deal with men. They both have to deal with Kidana. They both have to deal with the realities of being a woman in war when women have, are just helpers or sexual objects. They both have to deal with that. They both have to be in a, live in a society where um, Aster was married way too young to Kidana. She was much too young to be married. And um, in fact, what happened on her wedding night, which was effectively a rape, um, changed her for life and creates a, a dynamic between her husband and her that they will live with for the rest of their lives. Um, so Aster also has her thing. Mm -hmm. She also has to contend with things, but it's also something that Hirut has to deal with. Um, and I wanted to explore the, the many layers within uh, a society, society, not just war. Yeah. Yeah. Something you talk about in interviews and also in articles, for example, you wrote a very beautiful paper in the Literary Hub last mm -hmm. year, is about the relationship to the books, content, and your own story, your great, great yeah. grandmother. Yeah. That, Gatte. So, so, yeah, I can talk about that. I, I did not know... <laughs> I didn't know this story until I was almost done with the book. And I had gone on, um, I had traveled to Ethiopia many times for research. Anytime I went on a road trip uh, to get out of Addis Ababa and to go into some of the regions that where my book is set, my mother would always come with me. She likes, she likes the trips as much as I do. Uh, we would have fun together. My cousin would drive us and we would often take these road trips that were eight, nine hours, you know, out and then spend days just traveling from one village to another. And when the book was almost done, I had done one of these trips with her as well. It was six days on the road and hiking and, and doing different things, um, going to these battle sites. And along the way, I had talked to her about the book as I had done for almost the last eight or nine years that the book mm -hmm. was being written, um, told her about the women, the photographs, all of this. I had found this image by then and I was telling her about it and wanted to show her when we got back um, home and she's very casually she was listening and um, she said ah uh, well what about your great-grandmother <laughs> and I really 
you know, every time I tell this story, I'm struck by not only what she said, but how the, the fact that when she said it, I was so shocked that my mind went blank, that I couldn't believe I had just heard that. And I, and I turned to her and I, I said, what did you say? And she said, oh, your great grandmother, Etete, which is what we called her. Um, she said, she went to the war. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> all these years, all these years I've been trying to be careful about making sure I was completely accurate and I had someone in my own family. And my great, great, my great grandmother who had, um, was in it. A, an early marriage she was in, in an arranged early marriage when the war broke out um her she was much too young to live with her adult husband so she was still living at home and when the mobilization call came when when it was very certain that Mussolini was going to invade Haile Selassie said the elder of all the families get your rifle and um go enlist in the military. My great grandmother was the eldest. She was still a child, a young girl, but she was the eldest and she told her father, I'll go. And he said, you will not go. I'm going to give my rifle to your husband and he will represent us. Um, she didn't like the man to begin with. And I don't, I don't know what conversations happened in that house but my great grandmother said you you will not do that that's my gun and I'll go I'm the eldest in the family they argued somehow she took him to court and sued him um, they went in front of the village elders the judges she told her side of the story and somehow she won. She got the gun and she enlisted. She went to war. And I was telling this story not long ago and there was an Ethiopian in the crowd and he said, um, a historian, he said, wait a minute, what area was this in Ethiopia? And so I told him and he said, your, your great grandmother was right. By the laws of that area, the eldest family, male or female gets the gun she had a right to it and she she knew the law even at that point and she got it um so I had this in my in my family and had no idea um which makes me think about the stories of women mm -hmm. and it makes me think about the places where we speak women's stories mm -hmm. and the difference in the places where men's stories are told and um, I know that my, the female side of my family, my mother, her sisters, every, everyone knew the story of my great grandmother because they told it in the spaces of women in the kitchen when they're gathered for coffee or for tea. This is where those stories were passed, whereas the stories that were called history might be told in the classroom, which would involve the men. Um, and I find that really interesting. Since the book came out, I've, I have, when I speak, I um, often tell people, go home, ask your family, are there stories I don't know? What, what is it? Um, because my mother said, well, I didn't tell you because you never asked. <laughs> and I didn't know to ask. Yeah. Um, so I have said this and I cannot tell you how many emails I've gotten from people not just Ethiopians, but from all over saying, I didn't know this about my family. I didn't know this. And of course, Ethiopians, Eritreans, Somali, they've come up to me and said, I didn't know that the women in my family had this whole other history during this war. So I, I send that challenge <laughs> to all of you too. Um, we don't know what to ask. So we don't ask. And then the stories die with the people. It's very true. Yeah. It's very true. Um, before I open, uh, we open to the public. Just one um, question. What did you, in, in terms of history and women, uh, what did strike you in Switzerland? Was there something where you thought, <laughs> okay, oh. <so. laughs> Here we go. You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no, no. <laughs> well... Um, 
Okay, God, here we go. Let me just go yeah, right go ahead. The door is open. I'm walking in. Um, I was really surprised when I, I was talking with a group of women while I was here. Um, and I found out that uh, women had, had uh, gotten the right to vote in 1971, yes. which is not very long ago, um, which was really surprising to me. And uh, I think the perception... Yeah, it was just really surprising. And I have been asked uh, by different, uh, by journalists, you know, well, can we talk about patriarchy in Africa? And I said, <laughs> actually, you know, <laughs> let's start right here. Um, because there are systems of, of, of patriarchy, the systems that um, have worked against women um, feel so natural because that's how it's always been, that we don't think or question the possibilities that there could be a, another way until protests, until another country does something. Um, and, you know, we're in the midst of what I call uprisings and protests in the United States and around the world. And I keep thinking about the fact that um, there's a there there are heroic leaps of the imagination happening right now mm -hmm. to get those people out on the street and say to say we've done something for so long in the same way and yet we know that the, there's something better that can happen mm -hmm. and we're going to stand up and risk our health or our lives in order to demand a change. You know, just because something has been customary does not make it right. And just because something is tradition does not make it right. So those people who get out on the street and, you know, the protests even here in Switzerland, in Zurich, and I, I went to those, um, they have been incredibly inspiring mm -hmm. because every single one of those people are saying, I can imagine something different. And here it is. Um, so I, the, this question of, um, you know, women here, I think, what else? Like, what else can, can be asked? Mm -hmm. You know, um, how do we continue to disrupt the status quo? What else is there? Just because something has been done doesn't mean it should stay that way. Mm -hmm. um, and it's scary to think that because it, is going to um, disturb very calm lives, but nothing mm -hmm. is nothing. Nothing is ever just given. Mm -hmm. The system will not reform itself, and um, I think we're seeing a world right now where people are understanding that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much. I would like to open to questions from the audience. Please speak. Um, loudly, we can't pass the microphone around because of um, desin we would have to disinfect it each time and because, <laughs> oh, yeah. So, and I would repeat the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Just, uh, um, I would like just to ask you about this, whether at that time someone who were, you know, just on the front, I mean, that's the generation is now, I, I would say, it's only two percent of the Ethiopians are more than 60 years old. <laughs> In Switzerland, it's 17 or 18 percent. Eh? That means to find three people just in that, that age is very difficult. My father is now 90 yeah, years yeah, old. Yeah. He was at that time seven years old or so. He re remember, and his um, just family member, they went to the war almost 70. Yeah. yeah. The eldest brother also. And then he told me about those. So when he, he told me, I was so excited, really, just to read, you know, to start this book, mm -hmm. because somehow it brings me yeah. to that history. And, um, and then only two survived mm -hmm. from this mm -hmm. poison. Yeah. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Italians. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they used they mustard gas. Yeah. Rivers or the um, legs and everything were really just poisoned. Mm -hmm. They survived only two mm -hmm. from 70. 
from my mother's side, her father, he was 19 years old, and she was just only two days old. She doesn't know him, yeah. you know? And then I, I got a lot of such kinds of information. Did you somehow find someone who could tell you, I mean, uh, if it's not on, in that generation, but their kids, they got also a lot of information from there. Mm. My father, mm. he knows a lot. Yeah. Because when he was a child, with Italians, he had a fantastic time. And then they gave him honey, sugar, and so on, bambino, you know. Mm -hmm. he, he went uh, inside and came out in the, how to call it, the military mm -hmm. place. And then he said, uh, he saw how they play bocha, you know. Yes. And then he brought for the partisans, for the fighters, they asked him to bring some hand granules. Uh -huh. And she brought a lot of hand granules, my father. Well, he was six, seven years old, he told me. And then once he played with the granite, just watch out. <laughs> and then someone wants him, hey, please, just stop it. Could you, could you talk to someone who had a such kind of thought and the industry? Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. What you have just heard are the kinds of conversations I grew up with. I, these are the stories. So yes, thank you for sharing that. I, um, we have these stories in my family also of um, these interactions with Italians. The, in my family, um, my father's brothers and, and his cousins, there were groups of them and you know, not many survived. Uh, so when I talked to my cousins, um, about about this and our family members, those stories come out of uh, we did this and this battle and you know very much my my brother not my my um, father's cousin um, they used to hide in one of these places where Italians kept their honey and the sugar you know would steal it so this is um, I those stories are very much. Uh, so they're very similar to what I grew up with. And what's also interesting is that the memories that people, that people remember, people do not forget. Like your father has these memories, even though he was young. Um, and it's same thing in my family. It feels like this moment in history was so, it turned the world upside down. And, and, Everybody has some memory from that time, those people who were alive. And from those stories, very much like that, I was also remembering, writing down. I mean, just even two weeks ago, my mother told me something else about my grandmother's brother. I had no idea. He was killed by the Italians. And she told me what happened, how and where. And I had never heard this story before. So the stories keep coming. <laughs> and um, I hope that you've written this or you've told other people so that it does not get lost. And that's what I fear mm -hmm. for all of us. If you have stories, how, how do you save it so that it, it becomes history as well? Mm -hmm. So hopefully people write, write it down or record your voice saying it. Mm -hmm. You said you have been keen on getting into the characters you showed us uh, this Italian character um, who was for you like the personality to, um, to be between evil and good. And, and I wonder, how did you write it? How did mm. you get into his personality to find out this leverage of, of books? Yeah. You know, um, very good question. Because I, I thought, Oh my God, I have to write like a man now. <laughs> to, I have to think like a military, someone in the military. Um, where, where are my softnesses? Where are my vulnerabilities? Where, does, where, where am I disciplined? How, you know, I say me because I had to write like him in, in his skin. Um, it took a long time. It took a long time to write him. It took a long time to write Kidana, who is um, the, the military, the head of, of the army in Ethiopia, my, my, my army, 
uh, that I created. So I have these two men, one Italian and one Ethiopian, and both of them are brutal in their own ways. And both of them are also vulnerable in their own ways. Um, uh, Carlo, as an Italian, thinks of Ethiopian women in a very specific way. He has a lover who is an Ethiopian, a madam. She is, uh, a, yeah, she, she, a, a prostitute, but a madam. Um, and so thinking about the scenes where the two of them are, are together uh, was really tricky. <laughs> because I had to think like him and think like her. Um, and how do I write these scenes that were emotionally honest? So I'm not trying to make them behave in the way I want them to behave. They're behaving the way they would behave. Um, the same thing with Kidana and Aster and their relationship, the intimacies between them. Um, I wanted to make as honest as possible because one of the things is that before the war started, Aster and Kidana were already fighting and there was already tension. And when the war begins, it doesn't get better. So how do I work with a marriage in a war? Uh, and then Kidana has, you know, an attraction to Hirut. And that was a, another balancing act. So um, to write these men was, prob was one of the hardest things. Um, I wanted to be as emotionally honest and psychologically honest as possible. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't showing anyone the work as I was writing it because I wanted it to be, I wanted, I wanted to keep it uh, as much under my own influence as possible until the very, very end. Um, and there was only one scene. Um, I won't, I won't say which one, but you might be able to guess which one. There was one scene where I said, I, I asked someone, a male to read it. And I said, is this what a man would think? <laughs> He's like, oh my God, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but it's really not gender, I think. It's just this, it's, it's understanding the psychology of these particular mm -hmm. personalities mm -hmm. that I had to get. And then how they, how they interpret intimacy. Yeah. I have a question. You, you said something very interesting about the identity of soldiers that is following borders. Mm. And um, the last weeks when I saw pictures of policemen here and there, I was always wondering what they think and whether there is doubts, etc. Mm -hmm. So what did you find out about why people follow borders? I mean, maybe it's a too big question, but um, that's something... I think that is a really good question. Can, I, can you just yeah, repeat it? For uh, he asked, and it was a really interesting question about, um, I'd mentioned the way sol soldiers follow orders, but, you know, what have, what have I thought watching the, the protests and, and the police behavior, and they are also following orders? Ah, you know, um, I think that... Uh, I do think that the police are also acting, um, in general, they are, uh, those acts of extreme violence that we are seeing, I think those are the human beings acting out aggressively. But I also have been thinking about, and I've, I've been talking about this with friends of mine, is that um, the way that the, the police force is in, structured in the United States, a lot of these policemen uh, are veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. So if you can imagine what they did in Iraq and Af in, in Afghanistan, and then they, are, they retire from the military and go into the police force, you can understand what's happening now. Um, I teach in a university in New York, and um, I'll just tell this story quickly. But I had a student in my class who had been... In, based in Iraq and then Afghanistan, um, I think for about 10 years, then retired, went into the police force, and now was taking a class with me under, uh, I think, the GI Bill. Very polite, 
came to my class, came to my office before class started, brought his two little kids, wanted to make sure that I understood all the dates that he would have to be away for training and he would catch up with homework and he would let me know and, you know, but this is the schedule for the year and is it okay, ma'am? Is it fine with you, ma'am? Is it? And I said, yes, of course, thank you so much. Um, he came to class all the time. Um, he took my African American literature class. And there was towards the end of the year, it was the year that Michael Brown was killed by police. And the, the protests in Ferguson were happening at that time. And my students who were mostly black and Latino um, were really upset. So at some point I stopped the class because I knew that they weren't concentrating and I said, let's talk about what's, what just happened this week. He was there and he did not say anything for a while and one of my students said, I'd like to stand up and say something to the class. I said, okay. And it was a really sweet and I, you know, my students are first generation American, first, first of their family to go to college. They're, they're poor. They're working two or three jobs. You know, they come to my class. They've already worked a full day. He said, I'd like to say something. I said, okay. And he stood up and gave this very heartfelt talk about seeing Mike Brown killed and feeling like he was not safe in America. And, um, and then he sat down and I thanked him for this and I said, how do we work with, how do we work with each other in this classroom? What, does, what is the place of literature in a world where this is happening? Um, and this is when the policeman raised his hand and he was very upset that we were having this conversation because he said, you don't understand the type of people we have to deal with. And my entire class tensed up. <laughs> and, um, and he said, I was a guard at Guantanamo Bay. And he said, and all of the things that they've said about the torture, they're lies, they never happened. We are, you don't know what we have to deal with. So I think um, I sat there quietly. And I had to make a decision about how <laughs> I was going to react. And it would have been very easy. I was furious. Um, but I had a whole bunch, I had uh, all these kids in the class and they're looking at me and trying to figure out what I'm going to say. <laughs> and I, he said, the one thing he said was, Mike Brown was no angel. And I realized I, that this is what, the cops believe that if they can find that example of that one person who might have been a drug dealer or might have done this or might have done that, then that justifies everything that's happened. That's how they can accept what they do. Um, so I said, um, I told him, you're taking this class. So I appreciate the fact that you are here and because you're in this class, I'm going to trust that what I say to you, you can hear me. Um, and I, I said, my problem is, how do you leave a body out on the street for five hours without doing anything? You know, how does a human being do that to another human being? And if you want to say Mike Brown was no angel, I said, how do you explain Trayvon Martin who was 13, and Tamir Rice, who was 11. How does that happen? And, and I said, we can talk about Guantanamo Bay, but he picked the wrong professor because <laughs> I study that kind of violence. So mm -hmm. I know those soldiers who were in those torture rooms. I know them. And I said, um, what, what, what part of what area of the camp were you in? And he was completely shocked that I would know. And I said, I know what they did to you. You know, they kept you separate from this area. Um, and we had, and I said, but this is not, a how do we carry a conversation? 
Because if you and I can have a conversation in class, and if you can have a conversation with the student who just stood up, there might be hope for what happens outside of this classroom. How do we do this? And we spent the next 20 or 30 minutes actually trying to have a conversation. Um, he was respectful through the whole part. I don't think it changed him. I didn't do it for him. I did it for the rest of the students. Um, and he stayed, he finished the course, did his work. So, um, but I think my encounter with him showed me how it's justified. But I had another, do we have time? I had one more experience um, right after the elections. The, uh, when, oh God, I don't want to say his name, but when he <laughs> won. Um, and then the, one of the first things that happened was the Muslim, Muslim ban and how shocked we were at that. And um, when that happened, my phone was ringing and people were saying, we're going to go to JFK and we're going to march. So I went. Um, and we were, they, no, the cops didn't show up for a while. And it was amazing to me how many people were at that um, at the airport, just like that, it seemed like. And we were there for hours in the cold. And um, at some point, the riot police came. And then the trucks came. And then they, um, they were standing in front of the glass doors of, of the airport, of, of JFK. Um, and then the, the, they were all around. And at some point... They, were, they stayed away from us, um, but at some point it started dispersing because we had been there for hours. But they had shut off the ways that we could leave. And we were trying to figure out, groups of us were trying to figure out how do we, how do we leave, how do we get out, because trucks are here, they're here. And at some point I just went to the front of um, the line and then cut through the line. And there was a row of, of the police and military in their the plastic things with the shield and everything. And I just stood up and, and stood in front of one of them. And I looked him in the eye and I said, will you help me find a way to get out of here? And I think he was so shocked. Um, and I said, please, <laughs> I said, please help me get out of, how do I get out? And he went like this and I looked and I saw how young he was. He was young. He was like one of my students, that young. And I said, please help me get out of here. I don't know how. And he just stepped aside. He goes, just go right through. And I said, and I looked, I said, thank you. And he looked at me and he was so surprised that I said, thank you. He said, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it just, that's just also another side, you know, there's also that, but, and you see these videos of people who manage to break that, that wall, that invisible wall. There's a video that went viral on social media not long ago of a young black man on a hot day that goes with water mm -hmm. and gives it to the cops and how it just completely shocks disrupts. them and dis yeah. it disrupts them, mm -hmm. disarms them. Um, I wish, I wish that that was possible more, but I don't think that that's always possible. And often um, from what I've seen, the protest protesters are getting attacked before anything and that immediately ex escalates. So it is, um, I don't think this stuff is over yet. I don't think it's over. So um, I'm curious to see what happens. And I, I really, you know, those, the policemen, um, they're damaged. They're damaged from the wars that they were in. They're damaged from the, the system that they are a part of. They're damaged from, from the racist ideas that they've been raised in and the fear. Uh, but right now, uh, what's interesting is that I think what makes this so different is that um, members of the Black Lives matter movement the protesters everyone is saying we're not thinking about that we need we demand change before um we start moving towards any kind of reconciliation and this feels really different because change is really happening um which 
for me is hopeful. We'll see what happens when I go back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's going to be yeah. next week already. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have time for one last question. If yes, oh two, one. Yeah, okay, two. two questions. Go ahead. Thank you so much for sharing your story. It was most interesting. I'm very curious to hear. I'm guessing you went to Rome for research. I'm very curious to hear what. How did you observe and the dealing with the past in Italy, with their history in Ethiopia or in Libya? How did you? Mm, they don't want to talk about it. They are really even now very uncomfortable about that. My Italian friends who um, have family members who have fought in Libya or they were in Eritrea or, you know, in Ethiopia have told me they didn't know any stories about their relative who was based there. It was just One of my friends said, Ethiopia is a wall in our family. We don't talk about it. Um, there's a big, right now there's a big debate in Italy about the statue of uh, Montanelli, which is in Milan. Um, and people are saying we should tear this down. And other people are saying, but he was a great journalist, but he was a fascist and amongst uh, other things. Um, this is raising the issue again for Italy. It's They haven't really... They haven't discussed it enough yet. So um, the book is going to be published in Italy um, next year. Sometime, I think, March, April, June, unless the virus uh, pushed things back. Um, we'll see what happens at that point when the book goes there. Yes. When I was traveling in Eritrea, I was amazed to see so many women in the army there. It seems to look the there and describe now. We yeah. Army in Ethiopia, would you describe war as a force of equalization? Ah, that's interesting. That's a force of equalization. equalization. Like whether war does, in a way it does. You know, um, it's interesting. In some ways it does because women in Eritrea in the civil war, um, And the women in Ethiopia during the Italian war, and also women during the communist revolution in, in Ethiopia, were part of the military. Um, but even within the military, the hierarchy is also based on gender. And one of the things that um, uh, one of the uh, fighters, an Eritrean fighter, a woman, has read my book, I don't know how many times now. Um, and she said in Hirut, And if you've read the book, you'll understand what this means. But she said she recognized herself in Hirut, um, the way that Hirut was both a soldier and valued for it, but also um, was less than a man and had to obey the, the desires of men in the military. So she was always still a woman, even if she was a soldier in that. We've seen that everywhere. The Black Panther movement in the United States in the 60s and 70s, the women will tell you that it was uh, the place of, of men was much higher. The women were, you know, comrades, but they were also sexual objects. Thank you so much, okay. Maza. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Maza will sign books downstairs at our Literatur Apotheke. Um, And we can't offer an apéro because it's still not um, possible. But I'm very grateful that you came all. And it was a huge pleasure to have you here in Zurich for six months. Yeah. Very strange <laughs> times. Um, we went, uh, yeah, we went for walks at yeah, least, we did. right? Socially distant walks. We, yeah. we did that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure we will meet again and yeah. we'll stay in touch. It was wonderful having you here. Yeah, it was It's great. a great book. Looking forward to having it translated into German. Yes. I hope so. I hope so. And touch wood. And um, stay safe. Come, kommt gut nach Hause. And oh yeah, du hast doch auch ein bisschen Deutsch oh, gelernt. No. Oh no. <laughs> No, okay. I, it's the accusatives, and I keep saying this. It's so hard. <laughs> it is really hard. Yeah, but I'm yeah. learning. I'm learning. I enjoy it. I mean, you're I the really first like who really took classes here. I did twice take classes a week, here. right? Yeah, and during coronavirus, it was online. Yeah. But the, yeah, it's a very, too many rules. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank you. Maza. Thank you all.